Jasmine is a speech language pathologist at the Parkinson and Movement Disorders Clinic in Victoria, BC, where she joined forces with the neurology department to provide new specialized services for patients with neurological movement disorders. Jasmine obtained her Master of Science in Speech and Language Pathology from the University of British Columbia. She has also worked in acute care across the South Island hospitals and is passionate about providing evidence-based care to the Parkinson's community and finding unique ways to help underserved patients access speech pathology services. Welcome, Jasmine. Um, I will pass it over to you now. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Speech, Swallow, and Communication series. As Alana said, I will be talking to you today about speech and voice in Parkinson's disease. So, like I said, this is day two. Last Thursday, we talked about swallowing and saliva management. And then next week on the 18th, we will be talking about language, cognitive communication, and have a guest speaker about technology. So do make sure you join us for that one too. Before we get started, I do want to thank the Parkinson Society BC. So I work out of a speech pathology program, which is generously funded by Parkinson Society BC. So I would like to take a moment to share our sincere gratitude. For those of you who might not know, PSBC is a nonprofit organization. It's supported entirely by donations. So we are honored that they chose to establish this program for the Parkinson community. PSBC works to empower the Parkinson community in British Columbia through providing resources and services to enable self-management, self-reliance, and self-advocacy. If you haven't already, I encourage you to explore their website at parkinson.bc.ca, which has many resources and opportunities to donate. Um, so I work out of a program in Island Health, specifically the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Clinic with neurologist Dr. Tuck. I would like to take a moment to thank Island Health and the clinic for their support in helping Island Health Parkinson patients access speech pathology services. Finally, I would like to thank Parkinson Wellness Project, or PWP. Uh, the speech pathology program would not be possible without support from PWP either. PWP is a nonprofit organization whose goal is to improve the lives of those affected with Parkinson's disease. We are very grateful for their generous support, which has provided a clinic space to house the program. I encourage you to visit their website as well at parkinsonwellnessproject.org for more information about their multidisciplinary programs and opportunities to donate. So as Lana said, my name is Jasmine. I am a registered and certified speech language pathologist. I began my journey in Calgary where I received my undergraduate degree in psychology with a double minor in speech language sciences and philosophy. Um, so if there's anyone interested in philosophy, write it down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. I then moved out west to the beautiful University of British Columbia, where I did my Master of Science. And I was very fortunate to start working with Island Health right away. Um, I have worked in all three of their South Island hospitals, and now I'm at the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Clinic. So um, I want to get to know you guys a little bit more. So you'll see there's a chat box on your screen. Feel free to write yes or no. I'm curious to know how many of you attended the presentation last week. This will give me an idea of where you're at and how many people might already be familiar with speech pathology. So if you see the little message box, you can type in yes or no. Don't be shy. I'd love to hear from you. So I'll give you a few moments here to do that and then we'll move on. Okay, good, we've got some yeses. Hello and welcome back. Excellent, good. Now, for those of you who have said no, that's okay. So I am going to cover the basics again of what is speech pathology and how we are involved with Parkinson disease. I'll then get into the topic you're all here for, speech and voice, and I'll be sure to cover some strategies and options for you. At the end, we'll have that question period. So if anything comes up, feel free to write it down, type it into the chat box, and then at the end, we'll have some time to discuss those, and hopefully I can answer as many as possible. 
All right. So your job by the end of this presentation is to be more aware of speech pathology and the role we play in Parkinson disease management. I want you to also be familiar with speech and voice changes that could happen and some strategies you could use. But as always, the most important thing is I want you to feel empowered in pursuing speech language pathology services. All right. So um, I do have to do a quick disclaimer, of course, please know that this information um, is for you for informational purposes only. Um, if you have questions about your specific condition and situation, please talk to your healthcare professional, okay? So um, what is speech language pathology? Okay, so um, in Canada, at minimum, we do have a master's degree. Sometimes we're called a pathologist, sometimes a therapist. Um, sometimes speech, sometimes speech and language. Generally, they mean the same thing. I'll be using those terms interchangeably throughout the presentation, um, but typically we're referring to our college name of a registered speech language pathologist, or RSLP. Um, so if you were to Google speech language pathologist, you would see pictures like this. And that's because most people assume we work only with children and typically on speech sounds or stuttering. Um, but that's not necessarily true. So while a lot of us do work with children, the truth is we work across the lifespan. We work with all ages. And our Foundation Speech, Language and Audiology Canada lays this out really nicely with our huge scope of practice and the areas we work in. And that's because we work with communication in all of its forms. So reading, writing, of course, the movements of the face for speech, but also the brain and the language behind putting your words together and understanding what other people say to you. We also work with other areas of the face and throat, including swallowing and saliva management. Um, we work in other areas, including social skills, hearing loss, and technology. So that means we're going to work with a large population. So everything from brain injury and stroke, especially if it impacts someone's ability to eat or talk, um, cancers of the face and the throat, or maybe someone had parts of their anatomy removed and need help eating and talking again, cleft palates, um, dementias, intellectual and genetic differences. We work with a lot of different groups, but the question you probably have is, what about Parkinson's disease? Well, in Parkinson's disease, people can develop changes in the main areas a speech pathologist specializes in. Um, so that includes speech and voice, which we're talking about today, swallowing and saliva management, which we talked about last week, and those slides should be available for you to view. And then next week, we're talking about language and cognitive communication. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that these numbers are quite high. In fact, the literature tells us that the majority of people with Parkinson's disease will develop some change in these areas at some point during their progression. Now, if these numbers are intimidating to you, please know that everyone is different, okay? So for some people, these changes aren't really bothersome and might be quite mild, whereas for other people, these changes become a priority in their care. Also to know, these changes can occur at any time. So for some people, they experience these changes early on. It might be the first thing they notice. And then for other people, it might be the last change they experience. So everyone's different. Now we're gonna do a little test your knowledge. Excellent work writing yes or no last time. Now we're gonna do a true or false, okay? So what do you think? Can changes in swallowing and, and uh, communication, sorry, be resolved by taking medication? What do you think? True or false? Will taking medication help with communication and swallowing? I'll give you a few moments here. I think there's a little bit of a delay in the responses as well. All right, we got a no, anything else? Give you a few more seconds here, what do you think? All right, we're getting some mixed answers here and drum roll for the answer, false. Okay, so kind of a trick question because it is true that if medications are optimized, we might see indirect benefits in these areas. So. For example, if your movement medication helps you have good posture and bring the food to your face in a steady motion, that could help with your swallowing. Whereas if your medication for depression or anxiety helps you pay attention better, 
that could help your communication. But these medications don't directly impact those necessarily. And for some people, even if their medication is perfectly optimized, they will still need a speech pathologist to help with communication and swallowing. So because of that, we do know that the Canadian Guideline for Parkinson's Disease in both of its editions says explicitly, speech and language therapy is essential to Parkinson patients' quality of life. So don't be afraid to reach out. Often there are things we can do about these changes, but you might need a speech pathologist involved, and the sooner we can help, the better, okay? All right, now we're gonna get into the speech and voice part. If everyone's ready, I'm going to start off with an introduction, then we're gonna talk about some anatomy so that we can understand what's going on with speech and voice. Then we're gonna talk about how it's impacted in Parkinson's disease and some additional considerations you might want to think about. All right, so unfortunately in Parkinson's disease, speech and voice is frequently overlooked. Okay, and this member of the Parkinson Voice Project puts it quite well. Um, they say one of the hardest things in life is having words in your heart that you can't utter. Now, if you're somebody who's already been impacted by changes in your speech and voice, this might resonate with you, right? Because speech and voice are important, just as important as your ability to walk and move. Okay, so there, for example, could be social stigma. Someone might assume how smart you are based on how well you talk. And we know that those two aren't necessarily correlated. Um, that you could feel embarrassed by changes in your speech and voice, which could lead to isolation. Um, that can be bad if you're not communicating with your family or your friends like you used to. There's also the dignity piece. So I like to remind patients that what you have to say is important. It's important to you and it's important to us. And your ability to communicate your thoughts and feelings matters, okay? It's important for your quality of life, but also consider emergency situations. So if you were in a predicament and you needed to call for help, could somebody hear you? If you needed to talk to a stranger on the street for an emergency situation, could they understand you? If you needed to talk to your doctor or a paramedic, would they be unable to understand what you're saying? Your speech and your voice and your communication are important. We can't overlook those in Parkinson's disease. Here's another quote from someone who went through Lee Silverman voice training, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. They said, if my possessions were taken from me with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication. For by it, I would sooner gain all the rest. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how does speech and voice work. We've established it's important, um, but what's kind of the anatomy going on behind it? So I have this video from a singer who used an MRI to look at the inside of their face while they're talking. So let's see if it works here. I'm going to pull it up. All right, and I'm going to play it for you. Everyone ready? Here we go. Hi, my name is Tyler Ross. I'm a singer, voice teacher, and vocologist in New York City. And using the magic of MRI technology, I want to show you what it looks like inside my head and neck while I'm singing. But first, let me warm up on a lip trill. How about a raspberry? Weird, right? Want to see that on an ooh vowel? All right. So as you can see, there were a lot of bits inside that were moving around. And that's because speech and voice is actually quite complex from an anatomical standpoint. So. When we think about our vocal apparatus, we can compare it to an instrument, okay? So one instrument has essential components. It has a power source, first off. That might be the air going into the instrument. It also has an exit for the air to come out as sound, okay? Now the important part in between the air going in and the sound coming out is the way we manipulate the air. 
So that air gets manipulated by keys and levers on the instrument to create sound waves. All right, and the same thing happens in your mouth when you talk. So for us, the power source is our lungs and all of the muscles, the ribs, the diaphragm involved in pushing the air out and up, okay? And that can be through our mouth when we talk, but also through our nose. And yes, we use our nose when we talk. If you do the M sound, mm, there's no air coming out of your mouth, your lips are closed, but you're still making a speech sound because the air is coming out of your nose. So the power source is sending air through our nose and our mouth when we talk. But just like on the instrument, we have to manipulate the air as it's coming out to create those unique speech sounds. For us, that can be our lips and our teeth going ooh and e, and our jaw opening wide and coming closed. Now, our tongue is a huge important muscle for this as well. It can arrange itself to change the way the air flows through our mouth to make those different sounds. We have a little palate at the back that separates our nose from our mouth, and that is important to make sure the air is going through our mouth and our nose when we want it. This is moving throughout our speech. We also have muscles down in our throat that help change the pitch and the tone and the resonance of our speech and our vocal folds. So, okay, now a lot of people don't really know what vocal folds are. We hear about them often, but what do they look like? Well, I have a video for that too. So give me a moment here to pull it up. Let's see if this works. All right, so if you were to look at somebody and you were able to go into their throat and look down into their throat, you would see their vocal folds. Now, if we took away all the skin and the goop, they would actually look like this. So in the video, you will see that there's two longer muscles going down. They've got a little bit of white on the inside, those are your vocal folds. The bones, structures, and muscles around them help move those vocal folds for you. So we'll take a look at this video to see what I mean. All right. Oh, when you're breathing in, keep in mind the lungs are underneath those vocal folds, okay? So to breathe in, the vocal folds have to come apart a little bit, right? You have to let the air down into your lungs. When you whisper, so they have to come together a little bit, as we'll see here. Right, so here's the trick a lot of people don't realize. To make sound, the vocal folds actually have to come together a little bit. And they buzz against each other very slightly to create those vibrations in the air to create speech. Like that, all right? I think the next one is when we talk. Right. So, you'll notice that the white part there is vibrating against each other, okay? And that is creating the speech. Now there's all these muscles around it as well that are working to pull it. Okay, and then all of the ligaments here, they're creating changes in the pit, the tone, the richness of our body. All right, so we're seeing it tilting and shifting. Now, all of that is controlled by very specific teeny tiny muscles. And it's a lot of work for our brain to control that part, all of the articulators in our mouth and our throat, and get that power source from our lungs, okay? So I'll go back to the slides here. The main message is that speech and voice then are complex movement tasks, okay? They're not as easy as we think they are. All right, now, how can they change in Parkinson's disease? Well, in Parkinson's disease, we talk a lot about dopamine. If you attended last week's presentation, you will recognize this because I talked about dopamine last time too. Dopamine is an important chemical in the brain. It helps different cells communicate with each other. Now, in Parkinson's disease, we're usually talking about dopamine in the midbrain because the midbrain is the part responsible for movement, okay? Now, in Parkinson's disease, we don't have enough dopamine, all right? And what that means is the part of the brain relying on dopamine, the movement part, is gonna be impacted, okay? Now, there's 
other things going on as well, but let's consider the movement a moment longer. So if your brain's having trouble getting the bits to move, right, to tell your body to move the way you want, that's going to show up in how your arms and legs work, but also how the muscles of your face and throat work when you talk, okay? Other things are going on too. So automatic movements can be changed in Parkinson's disease. So automatic movements are things you don't have to think about. For most people, that includes talking. We kind of just think of the words we want to say and let our mouth do the rest of the work. But that becomes harder in Parkinson's disease. So you have to pay more attention to the way your mouth, your throat, and your lungs are working to help you talk. Facial expression is also impacted in Parkinson's disease, and a lot of people don't know about this. So your ability to express how you feel through your face, maybe with a smile or a frown, that doesn't work as well. So what can happen is someone with Parkinson's disease can look like they have a blank facial expression, right? And it can be hard to read them emotionally. Now, keep in mind, that's not because of changes in personality or anything like that, but that can be because of the Parkinson's disease impacting your ability to use your face to express how you feel. Other things that happen in Parkinson's disease that can impact your speech and voice are posture. So in Parkinson's disease, we tend to get that forward face posture, that kind of leaning over, maybe hunching effect. Now, when we think about the voice, remember I said you need a power source, and that is your lungs, okay? If you're hunched over, your lungs aren't going to be as efficient of a power source. Whereas if you're sitting upright, your lungs can have their full capacity to keep you loud and intelligible. The other thing that can happen in Parkinson's disease is vocal fold bowing. So remember that video of the vocal folds and we saw them coming together and vibrating to create sound? Well, in Parkinson's disease, what can happen is they don't do that as well as they used to. So we get a space in the vocal folds that allows air to sneak through without buzzing. Now, when that happens, we sound quieter, maybe a little more hoarse or like we're whispering. The other thing that can happen in Parkinson's disease is changes in the esophagus. The esophagus is the tube that goes from our throat down to our stomach, okay? And we're going to talk about this in a little bit. So, another test your knowledge. So get ready to type true or false. Here we go. What do you think? A person with Parkinson's disease could have difficulty hearing how their own voice sounds. What do you think? Type it in. Is this true or not? Can someone with Parkinson's disease have difficulty hearing their own voice? I'll give you a few moments here again. I think like last time there was a little bit of a lag. I started talking and all the responses came through. I do apologize. All right, we're getting some truths. Good participation, you guys. Excellent work. It is true. And this is because of changes in the brain. All right, it's not the person with Parkinson's disease's fault. It's actual changes in the brain that are making it harder for them to hear themselves. So I often get patients tell me this. I feel like I'm shouting. And often they'll say, you know, when I'm talking normal, everybody tells me I'm too quiet. And then I feel like I'm shouting and people can finally understand me. What's going on? Well, that's a calibration issue. Okay, and so when we think about our voice, we can go from very soft to shouting, right? We have different levels. A person with Parkinson's disease typically falls in the softer, very soft category. Now, when we get them to increase their vocal effort to be louder and bigger in their speech, we can get them up to that normal loudness. But Previous to the Parkinson's disease, or for somebody without Parkinson's disease, that same amount of effort would have led to a shout. So the perceived effort for the person with Parkinson's disease is that they feel like they're using so much energy, they must be shouting. But really, because they're starting off lower, we're only getting them up to that normal volume, and that can be hard to distinguish. So that's why it's important to have a speech pathologist assess you and help recalibrate your system so that you hear yourself the way other people do, okay? 
So if it's hard to hear your own voice, then how do you know you have a speech problem? Well, other than people telling you and complaining, um, do you find that you're repeating yourself a lot? Do you have trouble talking on the phone? Maybe you feel like everyone around you is going deaf. Um, the other one is participating less. So if you find that, you know, it's too much work to communicate, you're just going to let other people talk. Well, that's important to notice because that could mean there's a speech or voice problem underlying and that you should see a speech pathologist. Other things you might notice is a softer voice. You might feel like your voice is hoarse or scratchy. Trailing off is a big one that I get in the clinic. So people at the end of their sentence or at the end of a conversation start to get quieter. An inconsistent voice can also happen where some days you feel like your voice is quite good, but then other days you can hardly get a sound out. Changes in how fast you talk or how well you articulate can happen. And again, monotone. And if you combine monotone speech with a lack of facial expression, people might have difficulty understanding what you're saying, and especially understanding if you're trying to be funny or happy or sad or angry, right? Now, if we see these problems, your doctor or speech pathologist might diagnose you with something called dysarthria. Dysarthria is just the fancy medical term for problems with speech and voice. Now, in Parkinson's disease, the typical kind of dysarthria we see is called hypokinetic. Okay, hypo meaning less or not enough and kinetic referring to movement. So we're not seeing enough speech movement, not a big enough voice or good enough articulation or big enough expression. So we're getting that dysarthria. Now, a speech pathologist is important here because sometimes we might identify a different kind of dysarthria. And if we think that your dysarthria isn't typical of Parkinson's disease, that can help us communicate with your healthcare team to make sure we know what's going on and that we're giving you the best treatment possible. Okay? So, if you are having that dysarthria and you go see a speech pathologist, they might want to rule out other factors as well. And this is because you can have changes in your speech and voice that aren't necessarily because of the Parkinson disease, but could be compounding the Parkinson disease effects. So hydration's a big one. Vocal folds love to be hydrated, but they really don't like caffeine and they really don't like alcohol. So if you're drinking a lot of caffeine and alcohol and not enough water, that could also change your voice, whether it's on top of the Parkinson's disease or all on its own. Strain is another big one. So if you were a singer in a heavy metal band or a teacher and you use your voice a lot without much rest, that could impact your voice as well. Things like chronic cough can also cause damage. And a big one people overlook is reflux. Okay, so remember earlier in the presentation, I said that people with Parkinson's disease can have changes in their esophagus. That's the tube from your throat down to your stomach. Well, what that means is there could be a higher chance of getting things like reflux or heartburn or GERD. Now, what does that have to do with voice? Well, sometimes something called LPR, and what that means is the reflux is coming up so high that it's irritating the tissues in your throat and sometimes your vocal folds. Now, when that happens, that irritation can change the way your voice sounds. So sometimes going to your doctor and getting your reflux controlled and managed can also improve your voice. Because of all these reasons, your speech pathologist might want to collaborate with your whole medical team. That can include your audiologist, your dental professionals, your ENT or otolaryngologist, the gastroenterologist, again, for those esophageal issues, and of course, your physician and neurologist. So do be aware, if you see a speech pathologist, they might want to be part of this bigger team so that you get the best care possible. All right, now, strategies and options. I know a lot of you are eager for this part of the presentation. I'm going to go through some of the philosophy behind treatment of Parkinson's disease, some of the programs that are available to you, as well as other options, and then strategies that you can start using right away. Okay, so before I get started, I do have to mention I don't have any financial relationship with any of these programs or products, although I wish I did. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in seeking these, do talk to your physician or your speech language pathologist. All right, here we go.
So in Parkinson's disease, you have a secret weapon. If any of you guys have an idea of what this could be, go ahead, type it into the chat box. Let's see if you get it right. So we often used to think that when you're a child, your brain's growing, it's developing, it's changing. And then when you're an adult, you kind of got what you got. But now we know that's not true. In fact, your brain is changing throughout life. And on top of that, we can control the brain, the way your brain changes through something called neuroplasticity, okay? So this is when we actually rewire the brain through behavior. How does this happen? Well, if you think of all the cells in your brain, they're constantly talking to each other, okay? They're communicating messages to control your movements, what you think and what you feel. Now, each time that those cells communicate with each other, that pathway is reinforced. So it's strengthened, maybe it's made faster, okay? So the more times you use that pathway in your brain, the more times it's reinforced. It gets stronger, it gets faster, all right? So when you are using neuroplasticity, you're actually changing the way your brain is programmed and the way it connects each time you do the behavior you want. We used to say a lot, use it or lose it. And we often talked about this with physical exercise. So if you went to the gym regularly and then maybe you don't go to the gym for a month, you're gonna notice you're not as strong as you used to be. You've lost some of that strength. That could be to do with changes in the muscles, but also those brain connections weren't being used, so they got weaker. Now in therapy, we kind of flip the switch on this and we say, not necessarily use it or lose it. What we're going to do is use it and improve it, okay? So the more times we use that behavior we want, the more we get that neuroplastic change in the brain. So here's another true or false. You guys are doing really well at these. I'm so proud of you. So what do you think, true or false? You can start working on your speech and voice early, even if your changes have been minimal. Well, what do you think? You haven't had much change? Should you still do speech and voice treatment? All right, I'm gonna give you a few moments here, true or false. Good, we got some answers. Excellent participation, everybody. Good, good, good. Wonderful, true, true, true. I can't say this enough. So that neuroplasticity, you can think of it like a bridge. So if you've got a bridge and you know that a storm is coming, what might you do? You could reinforce the bridge with wood and cement. You can make it super strong because you know when that storm comes, it's gonna damage the bridge and you still want to be able to cross. Well, the same goes with a lot of treatment in Parkinson's disease. If we strengthen those functions, if we strengthen those connections in the brain, then when the Parkinson's disease progresses, you have more of a bridge to keep using that function. So getting your voice and your speech stronger in the beginning can be protective for the effects of Parkinson's disease down the road. All right, so good news. There's been a lot of research in Parkinson's disease and there's a lot of amazing scientists and professionals who are dedicated to making sure we have options for you. So there are programs specifically designed for Parkinson's disease and specifically for speech and voice. So I'm gonna show you some before and after videos of people who've been through treatment. I encourage you, do not adjust your volume. So if you feel like the speaker is very quiet or hard to understand, that's kind of the point. I want you to keep your volume where it is now. And I'm gonna pull up the video, wish me luck, hopefully it works. It's been working so far, I don't know. You guys might be good luck. Okay, here we go. And just so everybody knows, before I hit play, if you're somebody who hasn't had a lot of changes in your speech and voice yet, or maybe you're just curious, so you're watching this webinar to see, um, these videos can be shocking, okay? And I want you to know that knowledge is power, okay? so. Sometimes people watch these videos and it can be disheartening to see the effects of Parkinson's disease with somebody. 
but these are aimed to show you the changes and the improvements we can make, okay? So again, knowledge is power. If you can watch these, I encourage you to do so. I'm gonna hit play now. Here we go. Noticed any changes in your speech or your voice that you would associate with Parkinson's? Yes, I don't speak loud enough a lot of times. Anything else? Horse. Uh-huh. Anything else? I stutter, which I never did before. Do this for me, if you would. Take a deep breath and say, ah, for as long as you can. Ah. Uh, Good for you. Okay. Would you say Parkinson's disease has caused you to talk less? Yes. Because? Because I stutter and then I can't be heard. If there's noise in the house, like when the kids come over, nobody pays attention to it because they can't hear me until I get mad and then yell. Okay, so that was before treatment. Now, this person went through a program called Lee Silverman Voice Training, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But first, I want to show you how her voice sounded after treatment. All right, let's see. I'm going to see if it plays. Perfect. Hey, everything's working. This is a good sign. All right, here we go. Breath and say ah for as long as you can. changes in your speech or your voice as a result of the speech therapy oh yes what have you noticed I talk louder I think louder <laughs> I'm going to sing with the son of the sons of pioneers one of these days with my my voice. <laughs> good for you that's excellent uh, what practicing do you do at home my odds my highs and my lows and I read out the, the mail out loud do you feel like practicing helps? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, do you feel as though people can understand you all of the time now? Majority of the time, unless it's my husband, and he'll say, what? I can't hear you. Yeah. Good for you. But I think he does that just to be cute. I think he does, too. <laughs> Has anyone commented that it's easier to understand you now? Oh, yes. I set some of our friends back when we went to their house, and I talked loud. Lou says, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> My daughter said, oh, Ma, that's you? <laughs> Isn't that good? Don't you feel wonderful? Oh, yeah, because now she can't say, I didn't understand what you said. Right? No excuses, right? Yeah, that's no right. excuses. All right. So what do you do when you want to be as easy to understand as possible? Think loud. Okay, what did you guys think? If you have any thoughts, type them in the comments. So you'll notice a few things in her voice. Not only was she louder and her articulation better, but she had more of that facial expression. She had more emotion behind her voice. These are all areas of our communication that we can work on, right? So remember I said in Parkinson's disease, we get that kind of flat, blank facial expression. When we work on our speech and voice and we focus on it, we can improve all of our speech and voice, all of our communication. So that was the program called LSVT Loud, Lee Silverman Voice Training. You may have heard of this one. It's quite popular, especially here in Canada. Um, it's an excellent program, lots of research behind it. It takes 16 sessions one-on-one -on -one with a speech pathologist, okay? During those sessions, you're going to work hard. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's tough. You're going to work on your vocal endurance, your power, and there's gonna be lots of different mechanisms and ways of doing this. So there'll be homework you do. You're going to do a set of exercises every day, plus bonus activities. And once you're done the program, there's a maintenance program called Loud for Life, 
which helps you maintain your speech and voice after you've had those gains in your one-on-one -on -one sessions. You'll know you've had this if you've had a speech pathologist tell you, think loud, that's the big cue we use. So if you are interested in this program, you can find a certified clinician by going to lsbtglobal.com, all right? Now, the next program that's very popular and is actually growing in popularity a lot, especially recent, recently, is Speak Out by the Parkinson Voice Project. So I'm gonna play some before and after videos from them as well. Here we go, let's see how this my skills work. All right, good, I think it should work. All right. So here's the before and after from people who've been through the Speak Out program. Change in your voice or speech? Yes, I have. What have you noticed? It's much softer um, and more difficult to speak. I speak louder, uh, clearer, um, and with intent. Here's another example of progress that can be achieved through Speak Out. Have you noticed a change in your voice or speech? Yes. What have you noticed? Well, often when I'm fatigued, I can hardly talk loud. So I'm louder, I'm more confident, I speak with purpose, and I'm conscious of what I'm saying. All right, I'll go back to the slides here. So again, you'll notice difference in lots of parts of their speech and voice. I see a comment here for confidence. Absolutely, if you feel like you can be understood, you can participate in conversations again, that's gonna impact your confidence. Also the volume, articulation, emotion, the quality of your voice too. So that raspy or croakiness, often these programs can help with that too if they're performed by a certified speech language pathologist. So Speak Out is very similar to LSBT. So you've got the one-on-one -on -one program with your speech pathologist. For this, it's 12 sessions, okay? And again, you're gonna do your homework. <laughs> you're gonna have to do all of these exercises with your pathologist. Um, and there's also little challenges we give you so that you can go home and try out your speech and voice with your family or friends. After you've done your 12 sessions, there's their maintenance program. They call it the Loud Crowd. And this is where you join other Speak Out graduates and you practice your speech and voice together so that you can maintain that neuroplasticity, maintain that function, right? For this one, your speech pathologist will often use the cue, use intent. Okay, so speak with intent. Speak like you're the CEO of a company or in front of a large audience. Now, if you want to find a speech pathologist who's certified in your area, their website is parkinsonvoiceproject.org. All right, so those are excellent programs. There's other options your speech pathologist might also suggest. The Speech 5, it looks like a hearing aid, and what it does is it just sits here and it plays background music to you while you're talking. It might sound annoying, but it uses science, specifically the Lombard effect, which means that when you have that background noise, it tricks your brain into talking louder. Kind of like if you were in a restaurant and you had all this noise around you, you start to talk louder. There's also devices that can help with your lung capacity, such as the EMST. We can use different exercises that are frequently used by singers to help the quality of your voice. In some cases, there's collagen injections we can do into the vocal folds, but that is specific situations in collaboration with your medical team. Um, and then next week, be sure to tune in because we will be talking about devices and technology that can help you communicate. So if you have questions about that, join us next Thursday. We have that amazing guest speaker, and I'm so excited for you to learn more from that. Okay, so the catch. Now, all of this therapy sounds amazing. Uh, it is quite intensive. Like I said, 12 to 16 sessions one-on-one -on -one with your speech pathologist. Now, for some people, this can be hard because, like I said earlier, in Parkinson's disease, the amount of dopamine in your brain is impacted. Dopamine is important for movement, but it's also important for motivation, the happy hormone, right? So if you don't have enough dopamine, your movements change, 
but also your motivation and drive might change. And it's not because of you. It's not because you're suddenly more stubborn or anything like that. It's because the chemicals in your brain responsible for helping motivate you to go to therapy and do these exercises is lower. So it's okay to feel less motivated. Talk to your health professional. There's often things we can do about that. Okay, so some strategies you can use right away. Now, if you're on a wait list for a speech pathologist or you want something you can start using right after this presentation, there's a few ideas. So if you are a person with Parkinson's disease and you're experiencing changes in your speech and voice, you can try giving context. So before you start a conversation, tell the people you're talking to what the topic is. That way, if during the conversation they don't understand a word or two, they can substitute or guess what you said because they know the general context of what you're talking about. Also remember to exaggerate your speech. Recall that you might not be hearing yourself the way other people are hearing you, so you have to speak slower and louder than you think you need to. Um, if you're really struggling or it's just a bad day, don't be afraid to shorten your speech. So yes and no answers, speaking in shorter sentences, pace yourself, okay? And then also don't be afraid to be creative. You can gesture, you can write things down, um, different ways to get your point across. You can point, you can show a picture, pull it up on your phone, things like that. And then don't be afraid to continue with your voice activities. So if you enjoy singing in a choir or acting on the stage or anything like that, which uses your voice, keep doing that. You want to preserve that function, right? So if you're part of any teams or sports where you yell lots and you're using your voice, keep doing that. Now, in the context of the pandemic right now, a lot of people aren't using their voice as often as they used to, right? We're not going out with friends, meeting up for coffee, things like that. So we need to find other ways to keep using our voice. You can try reading out loud or arrange to call a friend every single day so that you keep using your voice. Use it or lose it, but also use it and improve it. Now, if you're trying to communicate with someone who has Parkinson's disease and you're having trouble understanding what they're saying, there's some things you could do too. So consider the environment. Are there distractions, maybe a loud TV or radio in the background that you could get rid of or turn off? Consider your positioning. Always best to be facing the person and within arm's reach, okay? If you're trying to communicate from different rooms or you're not looking at each other, you're just making it harder for yourself. Consider giving specific feedback. So instead of saying, I can't understand you, try to think. Maybe you could say, please slow down or please talk louder. Cues like that can make your communicative experience more efficient. Always be patient and consider verifying what they said. So if you're not sure you understood correctly, it's okay to say, hey, I think he said this. Is that right? That gives the other person an opportunity to correct you and preserves their dignity in the conversation too. If you have more questions, there is something called partner communication training, which your speech pathologist can provide. This is when we assess your individual communication style and context, and we find ways to make your communication more enjoyable with the person with Parkinson's disease. All right, now, if you still have questions, there are some resources. Uh, the good news is these ones are free, so take advantage of them. The Parkinson Society of British Columbia and Parkinson Foundation have generously created these booklets with tons of information for you on their websites. They're free to download as PDFs. Alana put the links at the top of the chat, so go check those out. They're excellent resources written by really prestigious speech language pathologists who specialize in Parkinson's disease. If you want to access a speech pathologist for yourself, you have a few options. If you want to go public, you can get a referral from your doctor or other health professional. If you're part of a movement disorder clinic, they might already have a speech pathologist, so do consider asking. If you'd like to go private, then the Speech and Hearing BC website has a link called Find a Professional, where they will list a speech pathologist in your area who are accepting patients. All right, so I know we covered a lot of information. We have just enough time for some questions. So if you have any, go ahead and write them in the chat box. If we don't have questions, I do have another MRI speech video <laughs> if you're interested um, from the singer. So we can watch that as well.